COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And we are back and we are jumping right into our first conversation. We are going to be speaking about the economy this morning. And joining us for this conversation is Kay Menzies, who is a past president of the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the founder of Belize On. Good morning, Kay, and thanks for joining us. Good morning, Gavin and Marlene. Thanks for the invite. Yes. Well, we're glad to have you here um, because um, certainly, this is a topic that's been at the forefront of several discussions. It's um, one that's affecting a lot, and that is um, the uh, situation concerning um, the, uh, foreign currency um, and our economy. Now, um, yep. it is an ongoing situation that we've been watching, but um, perhaps for a little bit of context for our viewers, we can start by discussing um, what um, the current state of affairs are in terms of Belize's foreign reserves and um, perhaps sort of and the long-reaching effects that, um, or the general effect, I should say, that it, should ha that it has on our economy. Well, uh, we, are, we are told, the Prime Minister has said that we have at least three months of foreign re reserves, but what we're seeing from the banks is that the banks are basically saying, um, you know, we're, in order to preserve reserves, we're just going to hold back what we can and look only at what they term essential products. Yes. Um, I don't think anybody's seen a list of what classifies as essential products, but what we're hearing is more and more cuts. For example, I don't know that, at least in recent history, there has ever been an episode where credit card limits have been severely cut, mm -hmm. and that has now happened. And that's a sign that things are very, very tight indeed, which is not surprising since um, uh, tourism, which is a source of about 40% of our foreign exchange, has essentially disappeared from the economy. Yeah. Kay, if you don't mind, I I'd really like to expand the conversation. I think that this, this is a topic that we all need to understand as best as possible. And very often, we kind of uh, function within uh, our society here in Belize, and we don't pay attention or we haven't been fully aware as to the significance of having uh, foreign reserves and how that impacts the general economy. So we only start to pay attention when our credit cards get cut or when we start to hear about uh, these new offers coming out of the government. Can you explain to me um, why it's so important that we do have uh, the reserves and why the situation is so critical since we don't have US dollars coming in? Well, there's multiple reasons. I mean, from, from the point of view, we always hear people talking about the exchange rate peg. Yes. Our exchange is tied to the U.S. dollar. Our currency is tied to the U.S. dollar, like so many currencies throughout the world. And what that means is that we have to keep enough um, currency, enough uh, U.S. dollars uh, in reserve, hence okay. the term foreign reserves, um, in order to pay our bills at any point in time so that we keep the, the peg, uh, you know, keep the peg strong um yes. don't break the peg and so that's that's from a from a central bank perspective the importance of foreign exchange but to the everyday person and to business in particular foreign exchange is how we deal outside this country belize dollars are not accepted anywhere in the world except belize which means that when we trade when we export we get paid in another currency when we import, we pay in another currency, and nine times out of 10, that's going to be US dollars. Mm -hmm. um, we have some, some exports that collect other currencies, but still, then there's a translation usually to US dollars. And typically, we like it when the US dollar is strong because we earn more and imports are cheaper, or uh, in, in theory. Um, but the, the idea is that there is very little you can do in this economy without the presence of foreign exchange. And so we relied on the inflow of foreign exchange heavily from two areas. Uh, one, you clearly outlined the exports, whatever we're selling beyond our borders, um, specifically mm -hmm. when we uh, received that payment in U.S. dollars. The other main Correct. inflow was the tourism industry. And that's part yeah. of the main reason why we're here. Is that the case? Correct. Okay. It is. And actually, tourism is considered a service and tourism in, in the broad terms mm -hmm. and tourism itself is cover, is considered a service export. Yes. So, uh, for example, if if we are 
anytime anybody is doing any business outside the borders, it's talked about as an export. So BPOs are an export service. Yes. Tourism is an export service. And of course, when we sell, sell our agriculture, we know those to be exports. Yeah. So um, all of that, anything that earns foreign exchange, really. And so when we had just the complete halt of having uh, tourists arriving into the country, we no longer had that generous inflow coming in from just what people were spending when they arrived here right. and, and making those purchases. But this is where right. other issues of concern that we very clearly have heard from the private sector and many others for years come into play. And that's mm -hmm. the amount that we import. In other words, how much we have to buy from outside of Belize. Um, that's also mm -hmm. a, a critical issue here. Can you explain that for us? Well, almost, I mean, Belize isn't a manufacturing nation. We don't right. build cars. We um, do very little in terms of garment production. You know, there's almost, there, there's very little in terms of consumer goods that we produce here. So, um, you know, the clothes that we're wearing, the, 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 you know, the shoes on our feet, all these things we have to import in order to have them. And that's okay on a certain level. But the problem in Belize is that, our imports usually, well, almost always, our imports in a given year exceed. They're, they're much more than what we export. Mm -hmm. So if I'm importing $1,000 and I'm exporting $900, then I'm $100 short. And that's typically when the government borrows in order to cover that shortfall yeah. because we have to pay our bills regardless. Mm -hmm. So... Now that moves us into what we're facing uh, since the start of the pandemic. And you clearly said earlier that the prime minister in, had indicated maybe about a month ago that we, we wouldn't have to be too concerned because basically there was enough foreign currency or U.S. dollars to be able to cover our importation bill for three months. Now, many speculated whether or not that was true. We have no real way of being able to prove it. We must simply trust that that is so. Um, but the indicators, uh, as you clearly mentioned, the cuts on credit card limits, where the banks have clearly explained that this is a situation to be able to reduce um, the amount of foreign exchange that, or, or to be able to better manage the amount of foreign exchange that we do have in the country. What does that mm -hmm. say to you? Well, the, the issue here is that we, will, we, we have to protect the peg on yeah. one level. So we always have to have a certain amount of foreign exchange on hand, and that is priority. Yes. Um, and then beyond that, of course, um, there are certain foods, certain medicines, especially in this time, um, the discussion of medicines and so on is critical. These are things that we have to be able to import. And in mm -hmm. order to import it, there's nobody that, that works for free in this world for very long. So you can't expect to continue importing food and medicines without paying the suppliers. So the banks are trying to make sure that they keep money on hand to be able to cover those kinds of costs. And if in, a, in any household, um, sadly, we've also had, because of the tourism um, loss, uh, a lot of lost jobs. And if somebody walks home one day or gets home one day and realizes they have no job, the first order of business for them is, all right, what money do I have and how do I make it last until I find another job? Yes. So there are several questions you ask yourself in a situation like that. You've lost your job. You don't know when you'll get another one because there are 80,000 people out there just like you looking for a job. Um, so you think to yourself, will this last three months? Will this last six months um, in a situation where I have no income? So let me plan my, my money in that way. Let me think this might last as much as six months. So let me think how much money I have left and try to make it last over six months. So you cut what you spend yes. in order to make that happen. This is, this is, to a large extent, what's happening out there is that the banks are trying to figure out how long, like everybody else in the world, by the way, nobody knows what's happening here. We're all learning as we go. Yes. How long is this going to last? How bad is it going to be? When are we going to start to see some kind of income? Where is our existing income going to go? Because we do still have, for example, um, the government was very careful not to shut down industry during the lockdown. Um, in the hopes that exports, the, the agricultural exports, would at least cover some of the, the foreign exchange needs. So that remaining amount, how far does it go? How far does it stretch? And, and so decisions are made every day trying to consider that and trying to cover it, no? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And as the, the issue is... 
you know, we don't have a crystal ball. We're all just trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And, as, and um, that brings up s sort of an important question because we see the bank sort of already taking action. Um, but as this process unfolds, um, is this going to be a situation that the private sector is more or less going to have to sort of take the lead on or is the government going to have to step in and sort of um, manage the situation um, given, you know, their um, role that, you know, and, well, that they've had in the past and that, that they're continuing to have? It's going to be difficult for the private sector to go very far in the measures it takes without the assistance of the government. And when I say that, um, for example, if you are in an export business or uh, you have potential to export and, red, you know, there are certain measures of red tape that are holding you back, then you, you can't avoid the red tape unless government says, I'm going to cut that red tape for you. Mm -hmm. So in, in respect of that, when, when that happens, you can only move so far without, without the government saying, look, let me pave that road and make it as smooth as possible for you so you go out there and earn foreign exchange. Yeah. There's a couple of thoughts here. One, we can keep cutting imports. Um, there's, nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, let's cut imports to the bone. The problem then is, of course, you reach the point where you simply can't clothe your people, you can't feed your people, you know, and how much can you cut, really, yeah. with, before it becomes, um, you know, really ridiculous and we're all out there with, you know, leaky roofs and, 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 and no shoes and whatever yeah. else, needing car parts. Um, so you can only cut imports to a certain point. Yeah. Which means that the other answer to the question is to grow your exports. Mm -hmm. So the question then is, how do you grow your exports? Well, I think there, if we have an opportunity in the private sector to, to, to get out there and, and, and do business beyond the borders, then we have to look at that. And of course, if a business has export potential, I'm pretty sure it's looking at it and it's trying to get out. Often yeah. there is a need for maybe some change in market access. Can you please negotiate with this country because I have a buyer who wants to yeah. buy, but this particular regulation is in the way. Can you help me with that? Yeah. Um, or uh, in order to get this out, I need this kind of packaging, but I have to import it and I can't get the foreign exchange to import it. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, often then the priorities shift a little bit because if we look just at food and medicines, we forget that there are certain imports necessary for exporters in order for them to be able to sell. Yeah. We don't make Tetra Pak for Citrus Company. We don't make glass bottles for Marie Sharp. But they have, to, in order for them to earn foreign exchange, yeah. they have to package their product. No? So how is this? Because the, what we haven't been able to see is that there is already an impact on the business sector in terms of their access to, to a foreign currency to be able to make um, some of the purchases they were accustomed um, to making. And this goes both ways. I've heard stories from uh, small businesses, especially, that they use their credit cards to make purchases online, um, and they're not able to do so. But also, in terms of your access through the central bank, if you want to you know, uh, import what you typically would on a monthly basis, are you able to do so? Um, I think most businesses are now starting to encounter problems. I, I haven't heard any business saying, hey, I've gone for, uh, for an exchange, no problem. Yeah. Um, wh what we're encountering is that uh, some businesses volunteer, well, voluntarily cut their imports, yeah. which means that already things, you know, if you're in the grocery store on, on a weekly basis, you see less and less things on the, on shelf. the shelf. Your favorite items. Yeah. might be disappearing and you start to see spaces on the shelves because importation is decreasing. Mm -hmm. um, but on another level, if you are a small business, typically there is a lot of paperwork to go through in order to apply for foreign exchange and sending a wire transfer is a kind of an expensive and time consuming process. Mm -hmm. So where small businesses have found it useful is to be able to buy with a credit card, mm -hmm. pay the bill when it comes. And basically if you have, you know, 15 small suppliers that you're buying from, you basically pay one bill at the end of the month and save yourself all the red tape of going each time, 15 yeah. times to the central bank, 15 times to the bank to arrange for 15 wire transfers. Yeah. So this, this was a cost saver as well as a time saver, and um, particularly for small business. Yeah. Um, so the cutting of the credit cards has had a business impact in that regard, but also um, just the notion that if, 
if you are producing, if you are somebody who needs an import for a particular reason, let's say um, you're an electrician and, and you can't get uh, certain things. So, I'm sorry to be at the house. Um, you know, and, and, and so it's not as obvious at the, at the top of this yeah. discussion when you're, when you're looking at what the essentials listing is. Everybody, everybody has a reason why something is essential. Yeah. Um, and, and at this point in time, there are decisions having to be made, which is, you know, <laughs> really unfortunate at many levels. And so you know, we, we missed a little part of that just, just because of a break in transmission. But um, I think you said it before that there is no published list to say what is mm -hmm. being uh, considered no. essential right now. So I think you, you gave some really great examples from um, uh, things that are needed for manufacturing to uh, essential needs for uh, what would be services that we are going to need no matter what um, as an electrician. Um, so how do you know whether or not uh, you will be approved to get uh, foreign currency to be able to continue um, importing what is necessary for your job? Um, basically, we haven't been able to, as, as you say, we haven't been able to see a list anywhere. Um, we're not aware of any list having been published for essentials. So typically, it's that you go to the bank and you say, I need to purchase this, and you end up in what we call a queue. So you're in line, your your product, you're you're waiting, and um, usually all that you hear is uh, we're trying to give priority to the essentials, and and that's as far as it goes. Yeah. So basically, we're all just waiting our turn in order to see if and when we can get foreign exchange, which is one of the reasons that the government has has gone as far as to to try to create instruments in order yeah. to get mm -hmm. foreign exchange in quickly, you know. Yeah. Because it is it is getting to a critical level now. Yeah. Well, you know, this that was um, kind of going to feed into my question because you had, um, you know, you've spoken a little bit about the re the existing red tape, and I'm wondering if um, in the wake of this crisis, um, it's exposed um, or maybe exacerbated some of the existing difficulties that perhaps were even present in the best of times with doing businesses. Uh, with doing business in Belize, that is, and I'm wondering. Um, if you have any idea of you know, either you know, suggestions or ways that can ease um, some of the restrictions that um, businesses do have to go through in order to access um, you know, foreign exchange and do business, um, are there ways that we can improve this right now? Um, yes, there's always ways. And actually, none of them are probably, um, well, you, we, well, let's put it this way, not a lot of measures out there are radical and new. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of them have been thrown out there multiple, multiple times and discussed even on this show quite mm -hmm. a few times, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the idea is if you are a government official and you're, you're looking at a process, the idea is to make that process as easy and painless as possible. There is a business person at the end of it trying to provide jobs. Yeah. And the reason that they're trying to provide jobs, and in this case, earn foreign exchange, we often don't have those two phrases in the same sentence, but they both matter very much at the moment, um, is that, you know, this is, this is for the sake of the economy. Now, if I have to, in order to get um, duty-free inputs in my product that I'm going to export to another market and try and be competitive, if I have to apply for what's called a DPA, um, and I have to go through a process and spend many, many thousands of dollars to do that, and it takes time. That's red tape. Yeah. If um, if I'm if I'm in a situation where I have to um, provide you know provide certain documents in order to get a loan from the bank in order to do what I need to do in order to get my product produced and on a ship to another country, you know, the, everything that we do every day is a process. When the when the process slows down and becomes multiple layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy that's when we talk about red tape and in this case i think each and every department of government owes it to us and to themselves to examine those processes figure out which are outdated unnecessary and really can be dealt with maybe even from a sector point of view um it it doesn't have to be that gavin walks in and his company gets approved but not marlene's it, has, it ought to be that both Gavin and Marlene have um, projects well, that fit in a certain sector, that have capacity to provide jobs, that have capacity to earn foreign exchange, and as such, 
Gavin and Marlene can just start up business within 24 hours with no headache. Yeah. Um, this is what a lot of countries in the world are working towards. And this is what Belize has to work towards. We've been having these discussions for many years. So long, but yeah. as, as you asked at the beginning of this question, yes, the, the COVID crisis is bringing it to the fore, just how critical these changes and how urgent these changes are. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate you saying that because I, I feel that um, a lot of the concerns, and, and to be fair, uh, that the private sector and, and the chamber has brought um, to the conversations here on the show are really becoming uh, glaringly obvious uh, now that we are in this crisis from um, when we used to talk about things like diversification, when we talked about um, making uh, some of the uh, uh, manufacturing processes and, and some of the essentials there uh, more affordable and easier to access and helping, of course, in opening marketing access. But the point is mm -hmm. that we are here. <laughs> And we have to make yes. decisions as to um, how we're going to survive this and move out of this. It's, it seems to be mm -hmm. a two-phase approach. Now, let's talk yeah. about what's on the table at this time. So the Prime Minister has announced a, a $30 million US dollar uh, treasury note. And uh, it is being seen, or he's called it, an innovative uh, way of getting access to, to a foreign exchange quickly um, and also offering a, an opportunity for uh, Belizeans as well. The Chamber hasn't necessarily put forward a position, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the note. No, I think um, for Belize, this is an innovative position. It's the first time I think, I, I'm not aware that we've ever done any kind of for, um, foreign currency instrument um, yeah. of this nature. Um, and it'll be, uh, somebody asked me on Friday and I said, I find it interesting. Yeah. And, and I do think it'll be an interesting thing to watch. Um, the, the idea is we know, as the Prime Minister said in his, his commentary introducing it, we know that um, there is a fair amount of US dollar accounts abroad. Um, it's uh, probably a good reason to bring it home. Um, or that certainly is the But should you be allowed to have a offering. US account? You, I don't know that you're. I don't know that you're legally allowed. I don't know that um, it's openly permitted, but it has, has been because a practice. of previous foreign exchange crisis. It has become more of a practice. Um, what do you want to say? Um, more honored in the breach, I think they say mm -hmm. something like that. But um, uh, so you know, we do hear of of um, you know people who have the capacity to earn foreign exchange saying look um let's keep it abroad so that we can pay our bills more freely or whatever and um so it stays out there and serves the purpose of its owner but often what you're finding is um those u.s accounts probably aren't paying much interest if any at all mm -hmm. and so the government has made sure to put uh, uh, i believe it's six and a half percent on the treasury note and um It'll be up to those uh, currency holders. And let's not forget, we have diaspora out there that are yes. looking for ways to invest into Belize. Um, they will have to decide if this is a good instrument for them. Yeah. But uh, so the government has thrown out an opportunity for basically you lend me, thir you lend me 30 million of your U.S. dollars yeah. for five years and I will pay you back for this loan at six and a half percent. And I'll break it down in a certain way so that I pay you back in years three, four, and five. I pay you every six months uh, your interest, and I let you form a U.S. account locally if you, if, you know, if that's the way you want it to be. Yeah. The the question for all of us is, of course, if we don't get our act together economically, um, I I say this in years three, four, and five, and in the years that we're paying interest, we have to have foreign exchange to do that. Yeah. So the, the underlying question of all of this is, do we feel that we will be able to earn the foreign exchange to pay these bills, along with all the others that we have in foreign exchange at the moment? And what that requires from the government is also a serious signal about what we spoke about a few minutes ago. You have to show me that you intend to help us grow our export industries to earn foreign exchange to cover all these bills. Because all these years we've been sitting there saying, let's cut down imports so that our foreign exchange earnings yeah. begin to catch up now it's time to get serious about growing your foreign exchange earnings to get ahead of your import bill yeah and especially now that well at least for um the time being 
um, we're not looking at tourism as a source of, um, you know, in, uh, of income earning for foreign exchange. Oh. So it's, it's ever more critical. It is. It is critical. And I think that's one of the questions that um, if I were sitting in front of the PM, I'd say, look, what is your government? Not him personally. It's, yeah. it's not a one man show here. But yeah. what is your government going to do to show? And, and this is called confidence. Yeah. Um, we always talk about business confidence and, and confidence in the economy. You have to make confidence building measures. And, and we're not just talking the stuff you do at the border with Guatemala. In this case, confidence building measures are measures that you take to show that you're serious about getting the economy geared into foreign exchange earning yeah. mode, as it were. So the Treasury note is kind of like a quick fix. It's, it's a quick mm -hmm. injection of US dollars um, so that we can be able to um, know for sure that we can be able to meet the bills uh, that we do have to pay. Um, yeah. From what you've gauged so far, you said people are seeing it as a good opportunity. Um, I think the conversations I've been having, I think people are intrigued. Um, they, they, you know, a couple of people I've spoken to equally find it um, as a creative solution. Yeah. Um, the thing is, the people I've spoken to are not the people that are able to go out there and buy it. Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting to see what the uptake is. And I think... Um, on a certain level, it's a, it will be a measure of confidence. Uh, we don't we don't have any index out there that measures confidence in the economy or anything like that. Um, we kind of typically go almost on instinct around here. But this will also show us for for those holding U.S. funds if they are confident enough that this economy will re will recover to the point that they will get their 30 million back over the course of the next five years. If, if there is a feeling of that and if it's well taken up, then that's a good sign. If it's not, then we have to go back to the drawing board and realize that there has to be uh, more confidence injected into the economy for people to really believe that my investment will have its return. What, well, you know, I think based on the conversations that we've been having since, I think we all took that sigh of relief when things calmed down with the health aspect of the pandemic. Um, there's been one... Uh, concern that has been raised consistently um, and that is primarily from from private sector but uh, what is the plan what is the way to get us out of where we are and not just um, kind of the immediate urgent how we're going to fix this situation today but your short-term plan your medium-term plan and your long-term plan um, with some innovative ideas, because I think we, we all have to accept that even if the borders are open, we still don't have a guarantee um, as to what uh, that rebound will be or how long that rebound will take for the tourism industry. From what you right. know, are, are there conversations happening about how we're going to be able to get ourselves um, through the next three months, six months, year, two years, and longer? Um. And you're absolutely right, Marlene, and I hope everybody listened to the way you asked that question, because this is not just about recovery now. This is not about getting back to normal. This is about how we, we pro focus on, on uh, recovery and then how we focus on, what do you want to say, reinventing ourselves so that we can be more resilient in the future. Yeah. Um, we, we have to plan ahead. We have to not just say, all right, I'm just battening down the hatches so I can get through this hurricane. It has to be that we have plans to rebuild a house, put the roof back on it, and make sure while we're at it that we build the house the way it should have been in the first place. Um, there are discussions happening. Well, first of all, all businesses are doing some element of that. Um, the ones that are surviving, the ones that have some capacity to survive are doing that. Unfortunately, there are businesses every day that are having to make harder decisions. And you've seen some of the announcements, yeah. the layoffs, the cutting of salary, and so on. These are measures that overall are about trying to make the business survive this. And hopefully the decisions are made in such a way that um, they, they don't impair the business capacity to recover in the future. But on a, on a government level, on a, or you want to say on an economic level, because it's all players, it's not just government. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, there has been discussion, there have been discussions. What we're not hearing, what we should have had already was a plan for getting through this cohesively, coherently, yeah. together. Um, and 
I think what we're finding is uh, th there was a discussion I had with a friend of mine and I said, listen, this is a little bit like a surgery. Um, you have the patient on the table. The surgeons are talking about how best to operate. And meanwhile, the patient is bleeding out. The longer we take to pull the plan together, the sicker the patient becomes. And that's why you're starting to see businesses make decisions that they took a while to make because they were trying to avoid this because they were saying, like, like we were talking about, do, it, will this last three months? Will it last six months? Will it last five years? And as the longer, the longer we take to make decisions that show that we're going to make sure this is the shortest duration possible, the, the longer we take to announce measures that ensure that this is of the shortest duration that it can possibly be, the more businesses realize that they have to make some of the tougher decisions. So the idea or is Or the bleeding that happens. Do, yeah, the... the and the patient only has so much blood. So, you know, we, we, we're really having to hear more about what's coming in terms of economic planning. And, you know, some businesses will tell you last week isn't soon enough. Yeah. So uh, you, we'll see how it goes. No? Yeah. And, what, and how would you describe the, the current relationship between the government and the private sector in terms of planning the way forward? Um, the private sector has been sitting at the table in several committees. I think what we're hearing on the ground is, well, I mean, businesses uh, as a whole are not hearing much. Um, mm -hmm. And the questions are starting. What are you doing? Really, how serious are you getting? Come on, we've got to move. Yeah. Um, so you're starting to hear the, the, the nervousness and impatience um, picking up. Yeah. And that's coming from the fact that financial reserves are dwindling. Um, people are finding less and less cash. At the time, the time period that banks have given for, you know, a break on your, lo uh, your loan, That's your loan payments an and so on, is coming to an end. Um, we're running out of, we're running out of space to move. So businesses are beginning to say, I need to know what's happening. And we're aware uh, that the, that the, um, the government has a, couple, has a couple of committees in place working on this. Yeah. But those committees, I think, need to start making moves that show that moves are being made, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, there need to be signals sent that show that, that, that there are changes afoot, that things are happening. And even we understand that the government has limited fiscal space. We understand yeah. the whys of the matter don't matter right now yeah. um, but the fact is we're here we're operating in very very limited room but there are changes that can be made in terms of laws in terms of processes in terms of procedures where the government could make a difference the government could say listen we have revised these five laws this package of whatever is going towards this industry because it has the capacity to earn foreign exchange suggestions have gone forth from the private sector well, over the years, yeah. but certainly uh, those suggestions have been going back in spades right now saying, remember, we told you you can do this and it will help us help you. Yeah. So those measures need to be looked at. They need to be taken. It need, things need to move along a lot faster because of necessity, the business community is beginning to get a little bit antsy, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and it's not just the business sector. I mean, I think just people who aren't even employers or uh, people who are even unemployed are talking about open up the borders because they understand that there is a financial crunch. However, in the absence of having options, it seems to be the only one we, we are um, working towards. And like I said, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have a guarantee. And this is my opinion, um, but I'm, not, I'm yet to see data to say that there are uh, plain loads of people waiting to come back to Belize to spend. So let me, let me, I like your analogy of, of the surgery because I think if that vein starts bleeding, you gotta clamp it and get working at the same time. So um, I, I think that we hear of this new idea to inject um, some, some money into, uh, or at least to provide for some uh, foreign exchange, which is much needed. Mm -hmm. But we do need ideas. My, my question, though, is, and Kay, you said it earlier, we, we rely a lot on anecdotal information. Um, you know, yeah. that, that we have the Statistical Institute, but they're limited in what they provide. Has there been, like after a hurricane, they call it a, a, a DANA, a damage assessment and needs analysis, yeah. to know where we are to get started? Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying let's just forget what's happening and let's go into analysis mode. But can it happen concurrently? And is there a need for that to take place? 
there is a need. The more data that we have, the better we can operate, all of us. Um, the, the, the government's operating in a vacuum. In the past, what we've had is people make assumptions. People make assumptions based on one thing they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the section of a picture, you're not seeing the whole picture, then That's it right. looks very different to you than the person who's seeing the whole picture. Data gives us the whole picture. And I'm not aware of, as, as, as you put it, and that's a good way to put it, I, I'm not aware of a, that damage assessment survey being done, per se. Um, I, I know that um, the chamber has tried to, has put together a few surveys of its own, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what's happening on the official level, um, if SIB or Central Bank have pulled together anything separate to that. Um, but what we don't have is the full picture. So those who are decision makers out there are, you know, making choices based on the obvious and maybe missing smaller between the lines kind of information. Yeah. And, and that's unfortunate because um, the more information you have, the better you can move forward. So yeah. I'm always gonna be somebody that says the more data we have, the better. Yeah. One of the things that this crisis has shown for those, for those who really want to see it is just how interconnected this economy is. Hmm. You can't think of any element of the private sector in isolation. And what we've seen is in the first days of the crisis, we talked about tourism being affected. We talked about helping tourism. And then we realized, yes, but tourism has a lot of downstream businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And then we realized a, a few other things about that. And I think people started to realize the business community doesn't exist in isolation. This is where jobs come from. Yeah. This is where products come from. This is where foreign exchange earnings come from. The government doesn't earn foreign exchange, it borrows it. Mm -hmm. but the business community is the earner of foreign exchange out there, be it tourism, be it BPOs, be it um, the, the export industries uh, in agriculture, whatever it is, any, you know, th this, is, this is how we earn. Yeah. And if we're not figuring out how to keep all those interconnected segments healthy, if we don't, for example, have a healthy workforce, yeah. which I have to say the health authorities did very well to ensure we do, yeah. um, we, we can't really function, but equally, if we don't have a healthy business sector, those healthy workers have nowhere to go. So this is the importance of finding how we make everything work. Now, you're right, Marlene, I think we've discovered, first of all, other destinations are opening ahead of us and we have to really work to catch up on that um, because there are competition. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's be blunt about it. We're, we're competing for tourism dollars at the moment. But also we can't lean entirely on tourism for the recovery because tourism is one of the sick patients. So tourism itself needs some help to be well again. In the meantime, we have other industries and opportunities we can be looking at. And the idea is to get out there, examine them, and encourage them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and what about an am amalgamation of efforts or thoughts or suggestions? Because, you know, we've, we've interviewed so many different people with different ideas and you know, we, we don't know what's going to work. I don't know what's going to work, but at least, you know, people are putting thought and energy into solutions that they think is going to be best for their industry. We hear from you. We heard from the tourism sector. Even uh, the president of the Senate has put forward um, his own views on economic recovery. So the ideas seem to be bubbling. It just seems that nobody is really bringing it all together. Yeah. And that's, I, I think we need to have that leadership and, and leadership is a big word throughout the world right now when it comes to COVID. Yeah. Um, we need that leadership that says, let's pull it together. These are our priorities. What fits under there? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do in order to make this all come together? Um, it's difficult with everybody doing their own thing, operating in a, in a vacuum, yeah. um, doing things in isolation for the story to come together well. One of the things from the beginning of the crisis that I've been seeing and I've been saying is that if that we have to pull together in order for this to work. Yeah. Um, and, and what that means is if I'm doing I'm off to one side doing something that I deeply believe is going to work and you're off to the other side doing something that you deeply believe is going to work and we're not coordinating. Yeah. Which outcome is going to be better? Two of us working in isolation or the two of us getting together and coordinating for better effect? Yeah, and, and, and merging uh, resources as well, whether that be mm -hmm. human or, or financial as well. And, 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 but it, I want to get in one more thing before we completely run out of time too. 
um, because we've got to break this down to, to, I think, a level that is critical. Um, mm. You said it, you know, 80,000 people applied for unemployment. Um, so that's just what we know as a starting point. As things get harder, that number may increase. Um, we also right. know that, I'd guess to say, the majority of workers have taken a, a pay cut of some sort. So things are really getting stressful uh, within households. And, and you know, while we talk about uh, businesses being able to, to do better and um, maybe keep their employees uh, or some of their employees on, it, it's going to take a while. What's the chamber doing in terms of advice to employers, how to handle this situation? Um, I know, you know, we, we talked very early on about having the business continuity plan. Um, but we're talking about real lives here and, and people who need, have families that need to be provided for. Yeah. Um, I think what has been happening, um, what we've been seeing coming out from the chamber and, and, and the discussions that they've been having is um, an, an, an attempt within the private sector limitations of saying, you know, this is what you can do in order to deal with your workplace um, in the COVID environment. This is what you can look at in terms of um, continuity. They've been bringing people on who have made pivots. Uh, you know, I think we the more famous examples are like Allegraphics and, and Slingshot and, and Travelers. Yeah. Um, to give people ideas as to how they can pivot their own businesses to survive. There's been a lot of bringing together of, of private sector entities in those kinds of discussions, which is helpful on a certain level because you you share by, by talking to each other, you gain ideas. Yeah. Um, in also the, the discussions in terms of finding out what financial arrangements can be made in terms of finding out what the legal requirements are when you're trying to assist your labor force, because certain measures that have had to be taken to avoid full layoffs weren't necessarily covered under the law. Mm -hmm. So the chamber has, has been having to advise on things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Port of Belize yesterday sent out a release that said, listen, we're doing the salary cuts in order to avoid doing layoffs. Yeah. I've spoken to, to small business people and I am a small business person who has had to make certain decisions to avoid doing layoffs. Yeah. And, you know, so these kinds of things, um, the, you know, the chamber has been able to kind of bring these ideas together. But to be honest with you, the chamber is not a lawmaking entity. It is not a policy adjustment or policy implementation entity. So um, let's, let's put the right weight on that organization. It is an advocacy organization and it must advocate. At the same time, the people to whom it's advocating need to give that, that, that advocacy a fair listen, especially now that you're starting to see that what has been suggested all along is what really was necessary for survival in moments like this. And what do you mean by that? What was suggested all along? Well, I mean, you've, we've heard over the years, I think I was at the chamber. I went first on the council in 2006. Mm -hmm. The chamber turned 100 years old this year. I think the, the documents that were found, archival documents that were found from 100 years ago, show that the chamber was advocating for tax reform from then. So, um, you know, in terms of we're talking tax reform, we're talking process improvement, we're talking that same red tape that we began the conversation with. Yeah. Um, all of these changes that have been suggested often are treated as, oh, that the business community wanted, then just want to make more money. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The, the fact that those measures haven't been taken doesn't help matters how they stand now. So, and the idea is that um, for an entity like this, a, a small business can't walk into cabinet and say, do this. Yeah. This is why businesses join an entity like the chamber so that it can be the voice. Yeah. But if we want businesses, small business, any business to, to survive, create jobs and, and earn foreign exchange, the absolute requirement is that we listen to each other, yeah. that public and private sector listen to each other and that the changes be made, but the changes, the changes have to be made as, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a joke now, and it's a bad joke. The changes <laughs> need to be as fast as nationalizations did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Next time, don't warn us. Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> I just but, wanted everybody to say it's important sometimes. 
but okay, so looking forward, because we, I mean, we didn't even touch the issue of, of the uh, mass amount of borrowing that is taking place, and we, we cannot forget uh, just the, the, the words of the prime minister in saying, well, whoever's the next leader, they're going to have to deal with the IMF, um, and that he's going to borrow and, until he can borrow no more. When you hear things like that, um, what does that mean to you? I mean, how, how, how do you feel about that? It's unnerving, and it should be unnerving, especially to anybody that, uh, you know, is, is uh, well, my family is 100% invested in this economy. Yeah. And um, so it's unnerving because if you look at it on one side of the, the, the balance sheet, the economy is projected to contract something like 20%, maybe. I mean, as I said, we're all figuring this out as we go along, but the yeah. latest projection shows a possible 20% contraction. So... I have 20% less economy, but I'm going to have more debt. Yep. And, and debt, before this all started, we owed 90, 92% of our GDP was debt. Mm -hmm. Or I should say debt was equivalent to 92% of our GDP. So everything we made was going towards loan payments, basically. Um, and now, if you're shrinking your economy on one side and increasing your debt on the other, I think one calculation somebody did was showing that our debt may end up as much as 123% of our GDP. And that's existing debt. If we're taking on more, think about it. Yeah. If, you're, if, you owe, if you own a certain amount of assets and they're worth $100,000 and you owe $120,000 and your banker suddenly comes calling, you're homeless. You're, I mean, this is, this is serious stuff. This, yeah. is, nothing to, this, this yeah. is nothing light. So I think as individual citizens, we ought to be very unnerved when we hear um, those kinds of words. Now, I'll say that and say, unfortunately, we have no savings. Yeah. We have lived beyond our means for a long, long time. So we have no savings. So to get through this, we have no choice but to borrow. But the question is, because remember where I started, I said, if you um, lose your job, you have to go home and you have to figure out what you're going to cut. You yeah. tell the kids, all right, well, you know, we're not going to go for pizza every Saturday night like we used to. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do that. That vacation we were going to take this year is now canceled. You make, you make choices and you, and you cut your costs. Yeah. Um, because you yourself don't have the power to print money to pay the bank. You'll yeah. get arrested for that. So you have to make cuts. This is where the government has to look at its expenditures and has been um, to a certain extent. But public expenditure has to be cut. Um, sacrifices have to be made not just by the private sector, not just by the people taking the hits in salary cuts on unemployment. They have to be made, sacrifices have to be made across the board. And that includes looking at, looking seriously at where the public sector can trim fat. Um, so if I'm spending less every day in the public sector, that's less money I have to borrow, plain and simple. And if I have to borrow less money, the, the thing about the money that's coming in right now is it's the much needed for an exchange that we're in a desert. And so every drop of water counts. Um, but at the same time, let's please keep very focused on the fact that all of this is money that we'll have to pay back, including the 30 million treasury, yeah. but also all the other IFI loans that we're hearing about. It has to be paid back. So let's be careful about this and let's make yeah. sure that we don't spend like in a style. I mean, it, it, it has to work for us to earn back our keep, to get back on our feet, yeah. to be able to earn that money, to pay it all back. Yeah. And I guess it, it, it just brings us back full circle where um, while you said it very clearly, we were living beyond our means, we needed, I mean, it, it was a month and we knew we were in a dire situation, so we knew that borrowing is really the only way we can survive for now. It's when people go for one of those payday loans because it's so urgent. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean it's sustainable. So we got to start planning on how else we can get other money coming in or stop spending as much as we're spending. Well, okay, yeah, we because the 30 million is coming in. And once the 30 million, what, we get the 30 million, we spend the 30 million, and then what? Yeah. There has to be a measure saying that we will get back on our feet and start to earn that foreign exchange sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, Kay, we really appreciate you uh, breaking things down for us. Um, this is an important conversation that we have to have. And, uh, you know, you've really put it a lot into perspective. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. And, um, have a good one. All right. Thank you, too. 
And from talks of the economy, we continue with another important conversation. We're going to be talking about the situation in the BDF with the allegations of sexual assault and violence. And we'll be hearing from a retired captain on her personal uh, experience and knowledge of how things work. So that's coming up after the break. Stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. <laughs> 